Greetings, respected viewers. I'm George from Ireland. I'm on Soho Square in London. Behind me, you can see the house where Mary Seacole lived. Uh, so she's best known for her nursing work here during the Crimean War of 1853 to 56. So uh, Mary Seacole was born in Jamaica in 1805. Um, her father was a white Scotsman, her mother was black, and um, so she was born into freedom at a time when slavery still existed um, in Jamaica. Slavery was only uh, outlawed there in, in 1833, or rather the law was passed to phase it out, and it wasn't actually abolished till, till 1837. As part of a compromise for the abolition of slavery, the abolitionists had to agree that it wouldn't be abolished instantly. It would be abolished gradually. Those who are held in servitude made apprentices and supposedly prepared for freedom, which is just a way that the masters could, could squeeze more unpaid labor out of people. Anyhow, so uh, she came um, here to the United Kingdom as, as a young woman, and there was a considerable black community in London at the time. It's thought that over 1% of the population of London was at least partly black. There's some debate about just how black she was. Some will say she was actually only a quarter black or something like that. And um, she ran a hotel briefly. Anyway, uh, the Russian Empire supposedly broke the Treaty of Unkia Skelesi about not building, um, building uh, um, naval bases on the, on the Black Sea. So the Ottoman Empire was an ally of uh, the United Kingdom because the um, Sultan of the Ottomans, he was supposedly the Khalifa or the Caliph, the leader of Sunni Muslims. About 80% of Sunni Muslims are, uh, sorry, 80% of Muslims are Sunnis. And the deal was the United Kingdom would be helpful to the Ottoman Empire and in return, uh, the Caliph would tell Sunni Muslims in the British Empire to be pro-British. And the, the deal largely worked. Actually, when it broke down in the First World War, and the Caliph, he um, exhorted all Sunni Muslims to revolt against the British Empire. Few heeded the call. So actually, um, his, his, his influence was, was considerably exaggerated. Anyhow, France, the United Kingdom, Piedmont, and the Ottoman Empire all went to war against the, the, the Russian Empire. Um, so they landed on the Crimean Peninsula. Well, redolent of what's going on today. Um, and fought the battles there of Balaclava, Alma, the Inkerman, and so on. There's the siege of Sevastopol or Sevastopol, as the Russians accentuate it. And Lord Sandwich was there, the one who invented the salad sandwich. We get Balaclava from the Battle of Balaclava, and I can't think what else we get, but um, Lord Raglan was in command, who was a um, dotant, and uh, was always forgetting that the French were on our side and not to attack them, because his last experience of war had been the Napoleonic Wars. Um, so trying to treat it like a fox hunt a bit too much. Oh yes, the Earl of Cardigan there invented the cardigan, that was it. These are the real games of the Crimean War. Anyway, um, the, uh, the commissariat department of the British Army was appalling and often soldiers weren't adequately fed, clothed, not enough medicines or bandages were delivered and a lot of soldiers were dying needlessly of their wounds, of illnesses. Um, so the medical department really wasn't up to it and this incensed public opinion back here. William Howard Russell more or less invented uh, the idea of being a war correspondent because um, the few journalists who went were a bit too close to the British Army and tried to curry favour with the officers by sending back um, laudatory reports about what was going on. And they, it was a bit of, well, not quite Stockholm syndrome, but they got into the mindset of army officers and were towing the party line a bit too much. William Howard Russell, an Irishman, hooray. And he told the plain truth about things and he became uh, lionized for that. Um, but so she went out there to do her bit for her boys as she saw it and was nursing them and was very hands-on even though she had several nurses under her and now Florence Nightingale also went around at the same time doing the same thing but um, Florence Nightingale gets most of the credit I suppose because she was very wealthy and well connected and Mary Seacole didn't have money to give but gave everything else that she could and undoubtedly saved many lives and contributed to the to the victory of the coalition there so she came back here after the war and was living in straitened circumstances but the men whose lives she saved had not forgotten her and they um they uh rallied around and had a had a what's the word i, I forgot the word but you collect money for somebody a whip round to, um to put her in a better situation you can see the house she lived in wasn't bad so she died in 1881 having lived to the ripe old age of 76 which was well beyond life expectancy for the time so she was largely overlooked in history it's only the last 20 years or so people have begin begun recognizing the fantastic contribution that Mary Seacole made. So not belittling Florence Nightingale's um, uh, efforts whatsoever, but just saying that obviously Mary Seagull, Seacole uh, was an unsung heroine for well over a century, and she deserves recognition too.